and um, um, his many journeys, actually, his journey as an athlete, his journey as an embodied person, um, and and his journey as a as a, an administrator and leader in Parasport. So, Jeff, we're going to turn it over to you. <laughs> That's a big task, a, a big <laughs> ask. I will do what I can to <laughs> to tie, tie all that together. I, I I really appreciate it, and certainly, if anyone has questions along the way, I'm happy to uh, to pause and and, and answer them. So, uh, thank you very much for for having me. What a, what a pleasure, and it, it was. Um, as Maureen, uh, you know, indicated, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and, and how me as the person and the athlete kind of um, merges or melds with, with Parasport Ontario. And yeah, in, in a lot of ways, it, it, it is a hand in glove. Um, I, I've been with the organization for probably 40 years. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I probably look at it too. But where that began as an athlete, as a teenager, and Parasport Ontario was my vehicle to uh, pursue my, my my Paralympic dreams. And when that was was finished, I, I um, went into the publishing world as a communication specialist. And uh, they needed to help Parasport Ontario, that is, with uh, developing magazines and programs and communication pieces. So I, I did that for a long while until I was asked if I'd be interested in the executive director position. And uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was an easy yes for me too. So it, it, it's been quite a history with the organization, which has changed quite a bit over the years, not just in my time here in the last five, but with the changing landscape of um, how uh, athletes with disabilities are uh, managed, you might say, from an administrative standpoint. But you know, for for me, I um, it was just writing a piece on maybe what the the real roots of a new Niagara Sledge Hockey League uh, are that that we've just um, just begun. We're launching next next week actually with four different municipalities participating in a in a community grassroots developmental sledge league, and it's kind of born out of. Uh, we're um, very fortunate uh, for those that know hockey and um, watch hockey. There's uh, a, a program called Hometown Hockey, and it's coming to Grimsby in in November. And uh, Ron McLean, uh, you know, formerly of Ron and Don uh, Cherry, he's the host um, with Tara Sloan as well. And we're interested in um, in the sledge team. So when I started looking at, you know, they're asking me questions. Why did you start it? And uh, what, what's the uh, the impetus for the creation? It really goes back a long time for me when I had the opportunity to get back into hockey uh, after my injury as an athlete with a disability. And what I, I mean by that is <clears throat> I had an injury when I was 11 years old, lost both hands in an electrical accident. I'm often asked if I was a electrician. No, not at 11. I was playing uh, where I should not have been playing, but I was a really active kid uh, before my injury, and fortunately afterward too. And from you know everything, soccer, baseball, hockey, football, swimming, bike, everything. And after that injury, I really didn't think I was going to get back into any sports. That just seemed so far fetched for me. And my dad uh, raised on a farm, country boy thinking uh, it was you know son, if you can still skate you can still play hockey. And for me, that was unimaginable. Um, yeah, I can skate, but what about the stick, Dad? And what about tying the skates? And what he tackled first was uh, creating this really unique, funny looking hockey stick for me, an adapted hockey stick uh, with a, a metal ball and socket on one end and holes in the shaft for, for my other hook. And um, he was determined that uh, his son was gonna go back and, and play, play hockey. Um, I resisted, he insisted, um, he prevailed, and I, and I did go back and, and play for, for one year uh, as a peewee. Um, and, you know, I think a couple of pucks maybe bounced off my stick or my skates and I, I score a few goals, which I still have those pucks painted with goal number one, goal number two, and goal number three. And that's how important they, they were to me. And, you know, after that year, I was able to convince my dad that uh, soccer was a much more natural sport for a kid without any hands. How do how about we try that one next? Dad? So he agreed. We we had accomplished a lot, but more than we knew. 
um, what that funny looking stick did for me, that adaptive piece of equipment, um, it, it created confidence in me through sport that I don't know if I would have found as quickly or as easily as I did, you know, just a, a year after after losing both hands. And it kind of dawned on me at that time that, you know, well, if I can play hockey again, uh, maybe I can do anything. And, you know, as cliche as that sounds, it was certainly true for me because everything was new, um, you know, not just sports, but learning how to be independent, um, you know, pretty humbling for a kid at 12 and 13, learning how to do up buttons and opening doors and riding a bike and, and uh, using a, a fork and spoon and knife. But I kept sort of harkening back to that hockey stick that if I could do that, I, I, I can do this too. So sports really provided that, that platform for me to uh, succeed, an opportunity to, to, to succeed. And of course, that definitionally was up to me what that meant. Was I going to be on an all-star team? No, but the success was getting back and, and playing with, with my able-bodied uh, uh, peers, that, and, and that's all I knew at the time. And, you know, the, the behind the scenes, too. I mean, of course, it wasn't quite as easy as that. As that. It was 1977, and um, there was no Internet or Twitter. <laughs> Facebook. I mean, I can go on and on. My parents were really on an island and uh, we lived in a small community uh, down in southern Ontario in Leamington and really had to be creative and uh, determined and advocates uh, unto themselves. They're, aside from the war amps, which was a terrific resource for them, they were fine in their own way. There, there wasn't a, a blueprint or a guidebook for how to raise an amputee child. <laughs> <laughs> let alone one without any hands. So I know, as I learned later, my dad went to the arena before ever I did and made sure that with coaches and, and administrators that this was going to go smoothly. To to get opposition when we arrived that one Saturday morning would have, um, there really would have been a blow to uh, uh, that building confidence. And um, and I think my recovery and, and um, learning how to, to manage my new situation or, or circumstance. So it was about community in the end. And uh, I was, like I say, very fortunate to be in a small town where the community did did rally rally around me. So once the hockey was behind me and, and I was entrenched in soccer, uh, other opportunities started to present themselves. There was a, a disabled sport club in Windsor. Heard about the kid in Leamington who can run pretty fast. <laughs> let's, let's get him on the amputee track team. And, and again, I resisted. My dad insisted, <laughs> and, uh, and he he prevailed again because they were all about just try it, try it once. And um, it was for me um, the resistance came from okay, I'm 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 trying to be like like I was and and like everybody else. And those are lessons I learned later in, in life that you just don't have to be like everyone else. And that comparison. Was kind of holding me back in in, in some ways. Um, so I I got to to the uh, to the track with the Windsor disabled Windsor Bulldogs disabled sports club and the amazing talent and personalities and individuals around me was was eye opening and and in no time I, I had another circle of friends. Um, yes, I didn't have to leave those that I grew up with, but now there were really appropriate peers for me and as I was beginning on that journey really learned a lot um, from from other amputees and I've, I've talked about that a lot over the years about appropriate peer support um, again back in 1977 when I was in the hospital my parents searched for someone that didn't have hands like me that could kind of show me the way and and um, something that I, I could look up to and um, they found a gentleman um, I think he nicknamed himself Handy Andy he was a carpenter he had a very unusual character sure of himself painted on the side of his beat up old white van which I saw roll into the parking lot of, uh, of the hospital from my from my hospital room and I mean I, I was terrified and and he was probably 40 years older than I and 
Um, I mean, no disrespect to, to Handy Andy, and I, I probably didn't know what Whiskey River and Tobacco Road smelled like at the time, but I think I learned later that, you know, those were, uh, that was the lifestyle of, of Andy, and it was a little bit frightening for me at the time. And again, no respect to, the, disrespect to that gentleman, but it, it just wasn't a good sort of first introduction or, or first experience. And um, certainly the, the, the war amps circumvented that in, in later years um, when, when I uh, found that, that appropriate uh, peer support. So something very important, um, that advocacy that my parents had to learn on their own. And um, uh, I, I'm so fortunate that was passed along to me. Um, and we really had to become our own self advocates at, at the time. And, um, you know, the medical world, uh, back then we were, um, you know, essentially told what kind of arms I should be wearing and, and how I would be using them. And, you know, over the years, I just found so many different ways to, uh, manage life. And again, with that advocacy and, and creativity is, is great sort of tools in the in the tool chest that, that my parents gave me. And a story that I, I talk about um, often is, is when I got to the point where I was that peer mentor and, um, and, and was cognizant of appropriate, again, peer, peer support. And I had a gentleman, he might have been a bit older than me, he was uh, in Philadelphia and, and lost both hands in an electrical accident, I believe, at work. And he was having a lot of trouble. He was really struggling and um, found me and asked if I could be some help. So um, this was all over the phone at, at the time. And I said, okay, where do you want to start? And he said, you know, I would just like to have a cup of coffee with my wife in the morning. And I said, okay, <laughs> what, what, what's the problem? He said, well, I, you know, I grabbed the, the, the cup and right away it tilts and it spills and I nearly burn myself and it's embarrassing and my wife has to clean up the coffee and ultimately hold the mug for me so that we can have a, a, a cup of coffee together. I said, okay, well, let, let's kind of break that down. Um, how are you grabbing the cup? And he said, well, by the handle, of course. And I learned <laughs> probably in in bar rooms and coffee shops that handles don't work for those that wear hooks like we do. Um, we don't have thumbs, opposable thumbs, and you need that for that for that handle. So, you know, beer steins and martini glasses, although no, no handles out in coffee mugs, they, they just, as others use them, don't work very well for our particular hand. So I said, well, why are you grabbing it by the handle? And he said, because that's how everybody grabs a coffee cup. And I asked him again, um, why do you think that is? And, you know, kind of stumped him. And I said, well, people use the handle because if they grab around the barrel of the mug, they're going to burn their hands. And we don't have that trouble <laughs> anymore. So you need to do differently. You'll get the same result in the end, uh, but grab it around the barrel. And, and um, I, I think you're going to have a lot more success. But so often we get caught up in that comparing others do it that way we need to do it too and um just i think it's important for people with disabilities to to be comfortable in in doing things uh differently to meet meet their own needs and um i think that's kind of my signature story on on that sort of concept um from that hockey stick to the bulldogs uh to several well three uh, Paralympic Games and, and three Paralympic podiums and three medals along the way and a, and a world record to go with it. I have often been asked, you know, how'd you, how'd you really get there? What, what, what was it that drove you or, um, or got you to those podiums? You know, I often, often joke that I, I just got sick of people telling me I had potential. <laughs> I said, let's, let's deal with this once and for all. So um, I kind of pushed the envelope with, with, with my own physical um, limits, I guess. But it was an opportunity f to find that level playing field that I, I could still run. And um, it, it was a way for me to, to set goals for myself and objectives and dangle a carrot 
you know, a little bit out in front of me to, to reach those, those goals. And again, it, it, it sounds very cliche, but that for me, as I was coming into my own as a person with a disability, this was a platform where I could find success. And, and that's not to say that has to be the way for all. Um, you know, it may be music or it may be art or it, whatever, it, it, writing, whatever it, it may be where a, a skill is to be had. Um, I just found it really important to, to focus on what I could do at that time in my life. And um, yeah, it, 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 it turned out pretty well. And, and again, it was back to that adaptive hockey stick at that developmental recreational level where um, I, I knew that I could if um, if I pursued it. So yeah, a very great time in my life. It came with a lot of travel and a, a great friendships that have lasted a long time and, and a real opportunity to, um, to succeed. And, uh, you know, for me, that success at times was learning how to tie a, sh tie a tie or tie my shoes, ride a bike again. But what that translated into some, uh, some bigger successes as well. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that's the Paralympic journey. Um, I knew I wanted to retire from the running part, um, but I didn't want to retire from the community. And, and that's what led me to uh, journalism and communications and a publish, publishing company that is very much focused on adaptive sport and recreation and, and Paralympics over its almost 30 years now, which, um, uh, you know, has allowed me to tell other people's stories, which, which I really, really enjoy. I, um, it's, it's an opportunity to tap into others' uh, lives a little bit um, where they might not otherwise share and and learn and and sort of harvest solutions for for others and much of the the many of the stories that we have done is, is is very much that i mean yeah i've been fortunate to interview some uh, uh some popular celebrities but it's those moms and dads of kids with disabilities who, who tell some really impassioned stories about how they found their way and how they managed their, their journey um, that have really kind of touched me and have been super important for, for me to share. One that I, I'll, I'll never forget, I, I was doing a magazine, one of my own for a while, called Play to Podium. And it was for youth with disabilities, but you know, for parents as well. And, and ultimately we wanted what the parents were, were saying to be shared with healthcare professionals as, as well. And a mom that um, I interviewed, she had two kids. They were mid teens, I guess, at the time, uh, twins, and uh, both with uh, cerebral palsy, one a little bit more affected than, than the other. He, uh, he used a, a scooter for mobility. Um, Mom shared with me in the interview that she knew she only had about a year to live. She was a single mom and uh, she was traveling back and forth to England for uh, experimental treatment for cancer, but knew the, the end was near. So she was very focused on teaching her kids with the limited time she had left um, all the life skills that they that she foresaw that they would need to to succeed and to be accepted. And uh, the, the the stories were remarkable in what 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 she shared. And one, and I'll never forget, they were, they're from Toronto. And she said, people can't hold the door open for my kids for the rest of their life. I do it when we go to the, she says, I do it when we go to a mall or wherever we go. I go up to the door, hold it open. So one with the walker, one with the scooter, I'd go through seamlessly. Um, she said, that's one thing I need to teach them. So she perched herself about 10 meters. Uh, it was at the Eaton Center and she perched herself about 10 meters away from, from the Eaton Center doors and uh, her child in the scooter encouraged him time and time again to try and, and open that door on his own. And I mean, ultimately he did, but what was just heartbreaking in what she said is that people that were walking by were just scouring at her and giving her looks and, and comments on what a, a terrible <laughs> mom she was in forcing her children to do that, not knowing the, the whole story. And I mean, as tough as it was for the kids, I cannot imagine how tough it was, was for her. But 
again, that's a strong parent, a strong mom, and and um, reminded me of my own uh, that 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 advocacy to empower her, her kids for um, for life. And I'm sure kids remember that story too. Like like I remember being dragged to the to the arena by my dad again against my will. So it's those kind of things that um, those kind of stories that have just uh, inspire me every day when I'm when I'm writing them and uh, keep me always looking for that next great, uh, great story. So that and as Maureen asked, asked me to, to talk about, so how does that all factor into what Parasport Ontario is today and, and how I've I've influenced it? Um, obviously, I came in with a bias to, to media and communications, and I, I really do think it, it needed it at, at the time. Um, in the past, and where I got involved was through the uh, Ontario Parasport Championships, the provincial games, and that's how we made our way to national teams and, um, and and competed internationally. Our organization about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, uh, uh, that, that kind of faded away because of the movement to integration and the, the Ministry of Tourism and Sport and Culture. And uh, I think there's a couple of more names in that ministry now decided that athletes with disabilities should be part of the mainstream provincial sport organizations. And there was some wisdom to that, um, but there were some drawbacks a- as well. So me as a track athlete, who used to be part of the Ontario Amputee Sports Association and then Parasport Ontario, that doesn't exist anymore. I would directly go through Athletics Ontario. If I was a swimmer, swim Ontario, and so on, archery, rugby, whatever it may be. And some of these provincial sport organizations were ready to embrace this, um, mostly at the competitive level. Uh, some weren't, and, and some resisted it, but knew it had to be done. Uh, and what got left behind was the, the development, the developmental stages, the, the, the grassroots sport. Um, so yeah, okay, Jeff's a, a, a high performance track athlete. We we we've got the coaches and we've got the um, the trainers and and the the pathway for him. But what about if Jeff was just um, and, I, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but just wanted to compete recreationally or was happy to just compete regionally um, or just wanted to get started and didn't know how? That was a problem and still a problem for some. So that's where Parasport Ontario really shifted from that competitive athlete um, focus right down to the base of the pyramid. If the Paralympic athlete is the tip of the pyramid, we're working in the weeds at grassroots um, to get people started, to recruit, to, to to cultivate and help them with the comfort level to find their their way and it's not the same as it is for many uh, able-bodied athletes Um, of course our new um, journey into parasport being us the disability community can happen at any age it it, you know we have an injury in our mid-20s or or 30s we're kind of starting again and need to, to to plug in so the systems in in place for you know youth development um they don't apply in all cases but there's the factor of you know a child a youth a young adult uh has an injury maybe a long time ago maybe it's new but first first thing is not that they're concerned about um, often is, is not finding a sport to play. There's there's so much so many other priorities: um, education, independence, uh, and then go into the the psychosocial uh, aspects of self esteem and self image and self identity. So people are just not lining up to join join a para sport. So what we try and do is help them through that process with a very personal connection. We know that. Anybody can look up where to find a sledge hockey team or a wheelchair basketball team online. And sometimes you'll find it in your community. Sometimes you won't. Um, What we like to do is is help that individual 
their family, their support system in feeling comfortable uh, answering those questions that they may have about getting involved in um, something that is very challenging and um, you know a physical activity with a physical disability they don't always mesh and um, that's what we try and do and, and help them uh, find that comfort level and then refer to those that can help them along the way and, and along that journey so that's our mission we, we we believe there is a sport for every body emphasis on the, the body part and um, and again I get to live every day hearing a, a, a new success story at, uh, at, at many different levels. We've recently donated a couple of sledges to Canscape programs where um, some youth with disabilities in, in the communities of Cornwall and Williamsport, I think, on the east side of Ontario, um, wanted to skate with their able-bodied peers, but um, with mobility issues, didn't know how to do that. They're doing it in a, in a sledge instead of standing on skates and and just thriving so um and, and i mean those kind of stories and uh, are successes for for us as much as they are for for that community so our our work here in in niagara which i wanted to talk a little bit about um started uh, a couple of years ago um we had an opportunity to put in for a seed grant with trillium to try something new and uh, with the, the seed grants, as you may or may not be aware, it, they give you they give you an opportunity to fail, and it's trying something new that then we all learn that okay maybe this this didn't work. And we saw um, what we wanted to do was create a multi sport para sport festival, and um, and in that connect community. Um, at all different levels, from activity leaders in be it fitness centers and yoga instructors to those in the parasport world that were doing the work at, at the grassroots level. So we knew it was important to um, you know involve the excellence here in Niagara that that already was. So we had a, a stakeholders symposium, uh, gathered a lot of information from that, and you know the usual suspects of, about the gaps and and the strengths, but. We wanted to delve further in, in, you know, what were some of those other barriers? And, and a big one that presented itself was connectivity, where there wasn't any. So iCanter, uh, the therapeutic riding facility, didn't know much or anything about the sledge hockey program in Port Colburn or the rowing program in, in Welland and, and so on. So we thought if we could bring all these folks together, um, one that makes for more choice for their participants and, and that's a big thing for us too that giving um, participants with disabilities the opportunity to choose what what sport they want to play or what sports plural they want to play so through that symposium we put on that, that parasport festival we had almost 25 different adaptive sports being presented at the uh, Scotiabank Convention Center in Niagara Falls uh, the center uh, donated two exhibit halls, so we had lots of space. So we made mini arenas and mini sitting volleyball courts and, and brought in experts and activity leaders uh, from outside of the region where it was needed. But where there were those leaders here, they were running those, those activations. But there was a caveat and that we learned in the past, and, and I think most of you probably know, the importance of, you know, not bringing in the sort of the circus caravan of all these great sports to excite people and then pack up the tents and say, hope you had a nice time, uh, we're on our way <laughs> out of town. Um, there needs to be something in that community where they can pursue that interest or that that excitement. So anyone that participated uh, as, a, as a parasport had to have a connection or a, a way for others, for, for our participants that uh, took an interest in that sport to play in in Niagara. One of the uh, my favorite examples of it was the um, the circus arts program in Niagara Falls. They were friends with the adaptive circus arts program in Kingston. They liked the idea of having um, clients, customers uh, with disabilities, um, taking circus arts, but they didn't know how. 
So what we did is brought in the adaptive circus arts um, performer from uh, from Kingston uh, to train them. And uh, I think four or five of the instructors took the course. We had that done before the, the festival. They brought all their rigging to the festival and um, did their sort of practicum on the floor uh, with the instruction of the adaptive fitness or uh, circus instructor. And at the end of the day, uh, I think they garnered eight or nine new clients, customers from the disability community, which you all know that that's a huge number. <laughs> You know, we, we don't, um, may not sound like that to most, but we know it is. And, and just a great example of, uh, you know, sh showing what's possible, but having a place to, to pursue that, that goal or dream. And that was the case with, with adaptive golf, paragolf, as we call it, uh, skating, basketball, and all the rest that came. So it, it was a great event. And um, we had schools come, we had plenary sessions, we had mayors, we had uh, uh, region reps, um, activity leaders, uh, recreation supervisors from the municipalities. And it really generated some, some new interest, I guess. And it, I mean, that pockets of excellence were here already. We will never distract from that. The, the Brock Niagara Penguins were uh, a huge participant and contributor to, to what, what we did uh, with that festival. Took that back to, to Trillium, said, hey, I think it went pretty good. And uh, from there, we put in another grant to expand upon that. And we were awarded a, a three-year grant to help essentially build participation in the region. Um, again, working with the stakeholders that, that are here, introducing new sports and just helping with those individual pathways to, to those sports. So um, we, me being from Niagara, I was living in Toronto at the time, I was able to, to move back to uh, my home, my, my now hometown of, of, of Grimsby and, and manage the, uh, the, the regional office. So for me personally, it's been wonderful. The two minute commute beats the two hour one any day of the week. Um, and some of the things that we're doing is we're going to do another Parasport Festival. Um, we uh, are launching a new uh, sledge hockey league, um, very grassroots de developmental, the one that exists, the Niagara Thunderblades are, are helping us do that and we'll be mentors and coaches for our, our newcomers. And they hope to see some of those players uh, recruited to, to their more competitive team, which is great. And we look to work with the school boards, again, in partnership with those that are here, um, rec supervisors and, uh, and, and beyond. So we're just really getting into the operationalization of, of that here as we move into the fall. And that's why Kappa is such a, a valued uh, partner of ours, because I, I think it's just so much you can help us with and hopefully we can we can help help you with some of the expertise that, that we've accrued over the years. So um, and that brings me to here. Um, Maureen, what am I missing? What uh, is there something that you'd like me to to touch on that uh, is scooted by? No, it's no, what, that was that just a great kind great of synopsis. Kind of synopsis. And, and um, yeah, and, and it brings you to here. And I'm, I'm hoping you could, like, entertain a few maybe questions um, um, back and forth, some interaction, because um, I know um, my, um, some of the tensions that I negotiate as a director of a research center and, and that I've negotiated for, you know, <laughs> 35 plus years as an adapted physical activity professional is this balance between the so-called segregated programs and um, and um, integration or um, you know inclusion and and how how politically important it is for disabled people to be seen doing things uh, and not to be sort of cloistered away where no one gets to see them or where people get to see them as like you say, special or freakish or inspirational, right? And that's the only role that that um, that they get to play, which is, is such a minimal 
um, an uncomplicated presentation of life with disability, right? So, so on the one hand, um, I, I want inclusion, right? Broad cultural inclusion. I want visibility. I want the same money going, you know, to to um, adaptive sport that that goes to um, regular sport. I want to see programs that are authentic, you know, where where if we have um, a, an integrated sport or a, you know a sport where we've got you know um, able, privileged, and and disabled athletes working together, that that works out well. But but I also really hear what you're saying about development, and it is so hard to do that in settings where you can't focus on the specific needs of the individuals that are right there with these with these complex bodies right and 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 there's so few trained professionals to to kind of engage in it in that work in a a legitimate way right not with just plain good intentions but but with legitimate strategies right they they know what they're doing so so that tension has always kind of not so much baffled me. I've, obviously, I've managed to balance it for almost 40 years. But, but, um, but I think it's a conversation that we need to keep having because the, the political necessity of inclusion is absolutely essential. But the, but the individualized engagement around development in activity and sport that has to be specific to bodies and has to be with communities of practice, right, where you can feel at home, where you can feel among um, a group that you can identify with, right? So, I mean, I wonder if you'd say a few things about that, because that's the kind, that that idea of development is really close to my heart. And I've been wrestling with ways to manage the political imperative for inclusion against the very real necessity of individualized, segregated development. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you haven't figured that out in 35 years. No. <laughs> You're asking me. <laughs> no, I, I guess I'm interested in your insights, right? Like, like, um, and and the athletes that you've worked with, and the and not necessarily high level athletes, but people who want to be active, like the the ways that they can work with development before they engage with. Ontario track and field or you know or Ophia volleyball or whatever do you know what yeah. I mean like like yeah. I think those kinds of transitions and and develop development based initiatives are are really important for authentic inclusion to take place in a lot of ways yeah it is so complicated and so many layers to it and you know for me it might be easier to speak to it from a person from the disability community than executive director of Parasport Ontario. I mean, yeah, exactly. There we have our, our, mission, <laughs> mission, our mission and our mandate and our objectives and I mean all of those you know scripted things. But when it gets real, um, you know, I, I, I've used the example of the and, and Jess is on the call and 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 she can speak to fitness clubs you know better than I but there was a time in my life where I was the fastest double arm amputee in the world um yeah. and, and a lot of confidence came came with that and um but it was still intimidating for me to go into and call it an able-bodied gym you know a good sure. life or, or whatever it was with my right. disability and doing things differently I was totally among um those with different bodies as, as you right. talked about the complexity of the body so I mean at the the, the peak of my you know, athleticism and athletic prowess you might say far from that now but um, it, it was still intimidating and as I said when I began I created two worlds for myself I had that amputee circle of amputee sprinters in the, in the Paralympic community but I also had that able-bodied network too and and honestly, they didn't cross over uh, very much. It was sort of a, a double life. Um, 
you know, I hear from recreation supervisors in, in, in the municipalities here in Niagara that, um, oh, well, so glad you're here to, to, to help. Um, we, uh, we want to, um, we, we have the design, we have the desire, but we just don't know how to, to, to bring it all together. So, and, and not that we have all the answers either, but we can, we can help. So when we kind of drill down to what do you want? Well, we want inclusivity in, in our municipality. Okay, so what, what does that mean to you? Well, we want a, pro, a program. I said, okay, is that, you know, inclusive meaning able-bodied and the community of people with disabilities can, can participate? They're not quite sure, but they have heard from some constitu constituents that they want something exclusive. They want something just for athletes with disabilities, which then back to the hat with the executive director. Okay, that's hard. <laughs> you know, you want that, but that's not really in, in inclusion. So, um, yeah, can we have both, Marie? I mean, there just doesn't seem to be enough participants and yeah. to, to to develop that. So, it is it is a teeter totter. It's it seems. Tension, yeah, I, I I see Jess's hand, and I'm gonna get uh, get to her in just a moment. But I I do think we. I think we can do both, right? But I think this is what happens when you consult and when you don't assume that you know what's best for a whole group of people, right? Like, like inclusion may mean at some point that everybody in the space is comfortable with everybody else in the space at the same time. And, it do, and, and we're comfortable with different people with different bodies doing things in different ways and yay hooray but <laughs> but um but to get there to get there um i think you know like we don't expect you know able privileged people to who like basketball uh, at a high level to go to the rec center and play with people at a lower level like they hang out with their buds who are at their level, right? And we don't expect, you know, um, cyclists to hang out with um, track and field athletes, right? And we don't expect baseball players to hang out with softball players. And those games are very similar, right? Like, like so there's no issues with this kind of specialized group that you feel comfortable with um, in a whole lot of of able privileged settings. Yet, <laughs> when we want to focus on development um, in a way that's, that gives disabled bodies, you know, complex bodies, the same attention, right? Mm -hmm. Or the attention that they deserve. More attention, I would propose. More attention, right? Because they haven't had enough attention. Um, um, then on the one hand, politically, mm -hmm. It's seen as well. It's not inclusive. It's moving towards inclusion, and it's and it's what the group itself wants. So at a at a level of consultation, it's it's important to find out what does the group want, you know. Yeah. And then at some level, if there's a way to do some intersection and interaction and so on and so on, yay! But if we have an inclusive community. Um, then, then there has to be room for lots of different kind of bodies to get the kind of programming they need. And I don't think that that level of need should be sacrificed because we need a political imperative that says everybody has to be in the same place at the same time with their different body, right? So, so it's, an, it's an interesting dilemma, but I think authentic consultation is the way to go. It's, it's the way to go. It's not assuming you know, that, that we know what's best in the same way that we don't assume, you know, like people who are doing experiences therapeutically, like say therapeutic riding, people with significant PTSD, for example, do a lot of work with therapeutic riding. Um, and, and, and they have very specific needs in their therapy <laughs> and they're different needs from someone um, with cerebral palsy, who's doing a writing program? You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. in that regard, I think we have to think about right the needs of the people 
who who need the programs, right? But yeah, and I don't think that level of consultation has gone on in a serious way. So that's, I mean, that's the type of education I'm hoping we're going to be able to do, um, you know, with with our allies, with our networks, so that we can have a both and instead of an either or. Either it's segregated or it's inclusive. Well, it can be segregated and inclusive in ways that maybe um, an able privileged perspective isn't taking into account, right? So, yeah. Jess, you had your hand up. Go for it. I think the only way we navigate through these challenges is by consulting and, and banding together. Um, and firstly, I'll just say thank you, Jeff, for your introduction and for sharing your story again. And I feel so um, honored and grateful to be partnered with Parasport Ontario as the executive director of Flex for Access. And I just had a conversation today with someone and I said that we've been partnered for over four years. And I don't think you know how much that means to Flex for Access as an organization and to me as an individual. And I would say, I would agree with both of you in saying that the level of consultation and awareness and education is not there, which is why I think, you know, we all wake up in the morning to do the work that we're doing from, from different lenses that we're approaching it. Um, but my question for Jeff, because I could go on discussing this for hours with um, everybody, with, with both of you and everybody else who's on the call. My question for Jeff is, as the executive director and also as a person with a physical disability as part of the physically disabled community, what do you think personally and then also wearing your ED hat, your executive director hat, what do you think is the biggest misconception or the greatest misconception right now from a stakeholders perspective, like from sport leader uh, perspective or uh, even like going at it from fitness perspective and how do you personally feel that you navigate that misconception both from a personal perspective and also as the executive director of Paris Sport Ontario? A lot to unpack in that one, Jess. It's a great question. And I would, uh, and thank you for those kind words that that, that you said. We, we feel um, the same way about your organization and all, all that you give us. So, th so thank you very thank much, you. too. Um, life, for me, from a young age, it's always had to be about education. Um, had to educate others how to be comfortable around me and you know a, a, a simple example is you know people don't know whether to shake my hand or not and um i have to be that first one and, and I'm, I'm i'm happy with it to reach out and and allow people to be help people to feel more more comfortable um and so it goes through so many different aspects of life uh, to try and pinpoint something very specific in in terms of your question I guess it's got to be presumption and not even misunderstanding or misinformation. It really goes back to what Maureen was saying about that educational process that I think we need to do before we even can get to authentic consultation. Um, I think many activity leaders and, and not all, um, you know, they've gotten to know people with disabilities some people with disabilities, but we're so diverse, right? Just you, your and I needs are, you know, very different as it would be for someone who is blind, as it would be for me with someone who's a leg amputee. So, you know, we get lumped under this big umbrella as the disabled or, you know, the disability community. And we are so diverse and, and varied in there and our issues are, are, are all so, needs are, are so different. But there seems to be that presumption where they, assume they know what they don't really know and and I, and I don't mean that in a in a negative way it's just where we need to start i think as informed advocates and and educators to to help them get to that comfort spot and again back to a a, a fitness example uh, good life and can fit pro have had me write some some stuff for their for their business business newsletter yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the one was, um, could you expand on this? If we build it, will they come? 
And I said, I said well, build what? And I said, well, we're going to put ramps and, and grab bars and, and make our buildings physically accessible. Will people with disabilities then come as part of our gym? So they're presuming that that's all it needs, right? We do that, they're going to come rolling in <laughs> as new customers. I said, no, I don't think so. And they I kind of took it down the path of, you know, when we as the disability community need to be accountable, we adapt every day and manage, and we come with that informed uh, knowledge base. So ask us, <laughs> you know, what what we might need. Um, I, I'm a real proponent of that. But it, I think human interaction, questions, sensitivity, sensibilities, I think is going to, as I've said to, to CanFit Pro, I think that's going to take your fitness instructors a lot further than advertising in the paper that you have grab bars and, and ramps. Because for me, I, I don't need a ramp or a grab, grab bar. Uh, you know, a lever door handle would be great, but, you know, I'll get by without it. So, um, yeah, it's a tough question to unpack, but I, I think it's that those those presumptions that um, this is what we need. And as Maureen was saying too, you know, the activity leaders, okay, we're going to be inclusive. What does that mean really what does at the it end mean? of the day? Yeah. And yeah. for all of us, it means different things. And so as an executive director of Flex for Access, you know, I'm noticing that throughout the pandemic, the um, emphasis on my work has been on educating the, the um, establishments that I work with and the trainers and professionals that I work with on actually what does you know adapting a fitness program mean and how do we go about it and how do we work together to create that education awareness and practical opportunity so it's great to know that we're kind of you know we share um the same sort of perception and in, in our work where where we need to go and i'm hoping that together we can just amplify our impact and when i say together i mean Parasport Ontario and Flex and with Brock, I know that I'm currently in discussion with Maureen about lots of collaborative uh, initiatives with the university and with Kappa. And I want to continue the conversation with you to look at how Flex for Access can fit into the work of Parasport Ontario. But really, you know, I was interested in hearing your perspective on, do you think that Parasport needs to exist separately from mainstream, quote unquote, mainstream opportunity, or should it be integrated? And I think you're right in saying that it differs for every individual. Um, so I think, like I said, if we can continue to collaborate and have our work and our voices shared, that's how we'll have a larger impact. All. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Thank thanks, Jess. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Other questions or comments? Elise. Jeff, I wanted to thank you for the engaging presentation and taking the time to, to talk to us uh, this evening. Um, and I think you brought up a variety of great points and um, you spend a lot of time talking about the benefits of sport or physical activity in your life and also about the importance of a support system. So in your your opinion, what would you say effective advocacy looks like? So whether that's self-advocacy or um, a family member or a friend who wants to support um, someone in the disability community? Yeah, good, good, good question, Elise. And for me, I, it's not lost on me that my parents, um, were very impactful in, in establishing the sense of that I'm going to have to advocate for myself. I'm going to have to ask for for what I I want, and um, and that's a tool in a toolbox, which I think there can be many others. And I had a conversation with a a, a prosthetist recently, and you know I was saying when we come to you, there's there's this deference and reverence even um, to, to, to your expertise and skill set. But um, what happens when 
you know, we, we leave and the, and the prosthetic device just, it, it hurts. And, you know, we may have been told in the past that, well, it's going to hurt for a while. Well, that, that's not a really good answer. <laughs> that's not an acceptable, <laughs> acceptable answer anymore. And he said, well, I would like to hear, hear back from you. And I said, well, sometimes you don't want to bite the hand that feeds. You know, we feel that you're doing us a, a great service and in, in, in the independence that you do provide us. But are we going to be critical of, of your work? And how would you even take that? Um, maybe someone just doesn't have the confidence, the, the, the language skills uh, to say, hey, this isn't good enough or, you know, I, I need something better. And he, he kind of sat back and thought about it and he, and he, and he said, yeah, um, I have recommended to, to others that uh, don't have that skill set to maybe use a journal as a, uh, a, a, a tool. So go home, write it down, um, you know, email it to me, bring it back to me. So I guess there's so many different levels how we or ways that we can advocate for ourselves and and sometimes we need to look to a friend or, or a family member or, or someone to, to 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 help us with that but we need a voice somewhere someplace and in, in, in some way and um I, I really feel feel strongly about that and that's why organizations like like Jess's exist and and like Parasport Ontario that are there to um uh, to, to help and advocate um, for others. So I, at least did I answer that question? I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. And as a follow up, if somebody wants to connect with Parasport Ontario, how would they go about doing so? What is the first step? Um, can call us for sure at 416-426-7187. And there's always somebody here that uh, can can help um, our, our website www.parasportontario.ca and it has a number of different contact forums. We have a, an Ask the Expert section where you can find somebody specifically that has expertise in, in what you may be looking for and you can send us a, a contact form about, about that specifically. Um, if you're looking for a particular type of equipment, there's there's that way to reach us. But yeah, I just encourage reach out out to us and and let us help. That's that's why we're here. And and to Jess's point, that's why we're not part of other sport organizations, mainstream ones. Um, you know, our um, situations and circumstances are different, and and we embrace that. And um, uh, and kind of run toward it, not r run from it, and and that's how we can help. <clears throat> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's that's. Um, I think the point you raise about um, um, professionals, especially like the the um, um, Elise and Demi and I have been um, attempting to offer um, adaptive personal training workshops. Get get ready for AODA um, for the past four years, um, and um, at our we we've had a grand total of maybe seven people over four years. Like um, some years they've had to cancel the workshop because not enough people were interested in attending, and and I think there's um, and all the research that we're reading um, in adaptive physical activity tells us that the the single biggest barrier to participating in community recreation, community fitness, community programs isn't architectural access and it isn't um, a lack of interest. It's it's the lack of preparedness and training of the professionals who run the programs. Wow. That's the biggest barrier. And that's consistent research across the past, you know, five, six years. So um, so you can build your ramps and you can have lighter doors and you can have and it'd be great if every button worked on campus for the doors to open. That would be nice. But, you know, we um, we were hoping to do an adaptive personal training workshop in August so that Jess and I and campus recreation could work with the personal trainers in our fitness center and have that happen and it still hasn't happened and it's October, right? So now part of that is COVID and it's difficult and so on and so on. And part of it is um, it's not a priority. <laughs> um, 
Well, you know, and then it's it's no one is saying this to me, um, but you know, previous years some of the messages have been, well, we don't have individuals uh, with disabilities in the in the center. And I said, the reason you don't is because you don't know how to work with them. Like, <laughs> like if you knew how to work with them, they would go because they would the word would get out that you had a clue and you would attract people to your center, right? Um, because um, because that kind of message spreads like a little brush fire. When there's accessible places and competent people, um, the community speaks like they they talk to each other and they let each other know. Um, we don't we don't do very much advertising in our developmental programs because the parents all talk to each other and right. and you know and and they 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 say yeah you can trust these people right so that's a big deal and when we do research because we built up trust over two decades. We're able to do research that other groups can't because the parents don't trust them, you know. So, so there's there's huge benefits to building these kind of networks and alliances. But I also think that the education of practitioners and professionals is woefully underemphasized, um, and it isn't because there aren't communities trying to help them. They haven't got a sense of urgency or readiness yet <laughs> um, or they're under the impression that it's so easy to adapt that they can just get it all done in 2025 but um, that's going to be a hell of a year if, if that's what they're, if that's what they're thinking you know so yeah Maureen hopefully we'll change that soon hopefully <laughs> hopefully we will yeah and yeah. determined to change it soon so <laughs> Right. Has the research gone that step further and, and asked why? Why are they un unprepared? Is it because? Oh, yes. A, yeah. A, yeah. 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 And I mean, the, the responses are. They're quite naive in a lot of ways, like the like for those of us who, who have been working in APA for years. Um, well, um, I don't think I'm ever going to see anyone who's that different from me. There's this whole idea that that complex bodies are this oddity uh, and and they're rare and and people don't tend to think that you know this is 20, 25 percent of the population. And unless you you die quickly, <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's going to be a lot more of the population because the longer you're around the more likely it is you're going to experience disablement because your body is not going to work the same way it did when you were 20 you know so if you last into your senior years and you want to remain active and functional and you want to be a citizen in your community then it needs to be adaptable it needs to be accessible because bodies are going to change and they're going to need um, adaptable environments, right? Universally designed environments. And people just don't seem to see a changing body as a possible future. It's profoundly naive um, um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, there's a researcher I follow, her name is Susan Wendell, and she has this um, <clears throat> proposition that she calls the myth of control. The myth of control. And she says, uh, the myth of control is the belief, um, however misguided, the belief that we can have the bodies we want, that through our own willpower and actions, we can have the bodies we want and avoid illness, disability, and death. And so she kind of lays it out as this myth of control. I present this to my students and they say, that's absurd. People don't believe that. And I think, yeah, they do. Because <laughs> all of our policies reflect this belief, like insurance reflects this belief. The, this concept called sick days reflects this belief that you can actually predict how many sick days you're going to have <laughs> in any given year. Like, like there is so much in our everyday lives that, that reflects this belief that it's become like an, uh, this unquestioned starting point. And that's where a lot of the research is going, that practitioners, especially younger practitioners, cannot see a future with a different body. 
they and they and they absolutely think that disability still is a tragedy that happens to some people, but not um, um, a possible way of being in the world that you know 20, 25 percent of the population actually is like right now, right? So so they're not seen as a constituency, right? That 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 spends money and that deserves programming and that have lives as citizens. They're still seen as this sort of exotic kind of marginal kind of mm -hmm. character um, still existing in a charity type of setup, right? When, I mean, that model is gone, gone, <laughs> you know, like, but, but, but there, but but um, but the 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 practitioner preparation is still very much stuck in that mindset that that um, it's an unfortunate tragedy, and I will probably never have to encounter it. Instead of seeing it as a likely way of being in the world that I'm going to encounter, and I will likely experience right, but. But most practitioner preparation doesn't include that kind of thinking or reading or reflecting or assignments or assessment. So, of course, they don't get to even try on these ideas. Right. So that's the big why. The big why is um, avoidance of stigma, naive sense of, you know, complex bodies, who who what who is a disabled person. Um, um, the idea that I'm going to be automatically awkward because I won't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess, but, you know, if we had a culture where it was less, you know, amazing to see someone with a different body, um, and that's like, that's the inclusion side that's so important for the political kinds of change that we need, right? That... Um, yeah, so so I, I mean, it's very discouraging research, I got to say, <laughs> in terms of the why behind the lack of preparation. And a lot of our students in our SNAP program, our coordinators, they all come from medical science, med sci program. And we ask them, do you do anything in your program, anything in your program on disability? No, they don't. Right. Um, it's it's it's. Uh, it's quite remarkable that, yeah. uh, especially with the number of individuals, you know, as it's a constituency. If this was like, if you were saying that, let's set out to ignore 25 percent of the population in practitioner preparation, you'd be appalled. But that's essentially what we're doing, <laughs> right? Wow. You when know. you put it that way, <laughs> it's disturbing. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So you said that it's discouraging research and I couldn't agree more. And in all of our conversations and in speaking to Jeff, you all know that I share that sentiment and that frustration. And that's why I am the advocate that I am and do the work that I do. But Maureen, I have a question for you and for Elise. And I don't know if Demi's on this call. Yes, she is. I really think she is. Um, but for you specifically, Maureen, and then both Elise and Demi can chime in. Though it's really discouraging research, and you know we've established that it is, as stakeholders in the in the community, and as also citizens in the in the disabled community, how have you seen it evolve as a professor in the field for so many years that you know has been in it and also does a lot of practical you know work and also has friendships with individuals who have disabilities as well. Like, how have you seen it evolve? Um, um, well, for, honestly, um, we do, uh, we do, in one of, I do a 400 level course um, where students have to do experiential engagements um, with disability communities, or they have to do experiential projects where they're doing actual adaptive design. So, that's been difficult over the past year because they can't go anywhere. Um, yeah, 400 level is fourth year. Thanks, Elise. Yeah, thanks. There you go. That's my insider jargon. Um, but, um, and what I often do in the early class, I do a, a kind of an early activity. I send them to the Paul Longmore Center 
for disability research and they do the disability literacy quiz right which is a, a 20 item quiz which tests their disability literacy so how literate are they <clears throat> about um, issues that uh, concern disabled people um, how literate are they about um, the history and the, the the sort of the move out of the charity model into the rights model into the political critique model right how uh, how literate are they um you know about disability as a cultural phenomenon and the lives of disabled people so so this year is the first year that i've had students one of the items on the quiz is about um helen keller and her and the decision to put her her image on U.S. money, and um, and the and there was four. It's multiple choice, so there's four options, and one of the options is she'd be turning over in her grave because she was a socialist, and um, which is the correct answer, right? So, um, but half of my class had never heard of Helen Keller. They didn't know who she was. And that's baffling. That's and they didn't go and do a Google search and look her up. Wow. Right. So. And that's this year. OK, so so then I. Um, I, I asked them about that. Right. And I said, well, I understand it's generational, but weren't you curious? Yeah, I guess. Um, and and but the thing that they said that really kind of got me thinking was they were surprised that they all didn't achieve like uh, what would be considered mastery level on the quiz because of all the background they have with disability. They have one half credit. <laughs> and and my course is the second half credit that they've taken. Right. So I'm thinking you don't have a lot of experience, OK? Like, what makes you think you got the right to a mastery score, right? Like, what is this? So <laughs> now I can't do that in class because it's, you know, it makes them feel it's humiliating. And I don't want to humiliate my learners, obviously. I don't. But I have to ask them questions. And I say, that's what I said to them. Do you think that a half credit qualifies you at a mastery level? Is that? Is that something you believe as a learner that? And and they said, well, when you put it that way, I guess not. OK, all right, there's hope, right? But but there's this. <laughs> so there's this sense that they're good intentioned and that's enough. They're well intentioned and that's enough. Mm. And then a couple of them said, how do we know this quiz isn't like just someone's opinion? I said, because it was generated out of the scholarship done at the Paul Longmore Research Center. That's how you know it's not someone's opinion, right? Um, <laughs> so there's a. It's an interesting relationship, um, and so uh, I find. I find that there are some students who show genuine interest and authentic connection and want to learn more. And I nurture those students and I want to keep them involved. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think for the other students who just want this as a credit or who just want the hours or who just want it on their CV, um, I'm hoping to make some kind of an impression on them that it moves beyond yeah. just getting the hours. But in, in the 30 years I've been at Brock, <laughs> I've seen very much the same thing. Um, well, it's interesting. It's a, can you hear me? I didn't know if my mic is muted or not. No, it's unmuted. no, it's not. We can hear you. It's a matter of perspective, right? Like, right. And even when I meet someone and like when I started Flex for Access, I started it to create awareness around CP. And I've talked to both of you about this. And, you know, people would speak to me and they would say, oh, yeah. Like I know, I know what CP is. I know how it affects individuals. And I would say, do you really? Because do you really? <laughs> the, the truth is, is that although the diagnosis is one such diagnosis, every person's individual 
diagnosis is different, right? Yeah. And it's about deconstructing that and, and allowing people to understand that, yes, we may have a diagnosis or Jeff may be an amputee, but we're all different people. Yeah. And I'm noticing as a leader in this community now that there's such a almost feeling on new professionals coming into the field, like both of you said, and more so like Maureen said, that they feel, and I've shared this sentiment with you, that that they feel like they don't need to be working with the adaptive community because it's so quote unquote fringe and like they're never gonna have to yes. work with individuals that have varying needs. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I, it's a, it's a, it's a tough dilemma, and and on the one hand, you want, I want every student to be exposed to, you know, this kind of subject matter, so that they have a chance at some point to follow it up. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, if I've got a student who says, "Yeah, can I get in and out and do my placement on one weekend?" and I'm thinking, please. Like, please spend as little time as you possibly can, because with an attitude like that, who wants you, right? So, <laughs> so, so on, the, on the one hand, I want to bring them along and nurture them and, and you know, but on the other hand, I also don't want them to gain credentials on the backs of disabled people and have them say that they did a, a worthwhile placement when all they did was putting in the hours to check a box right yes, so I was, I was gonna say that those are the people that I wouldn't want to be uh become kinesiologists and fitness professionals and adaptive physical activity professionals and I guess the question could go to Jeff too about you know how have you seen the Paris sport movement evolve and the work of Paris sport Ontario um but I'm also cognizant of time so if you could yeah. give me maybe a short answer that would be <laughs> awesome <laughs> Well, it, you know, as a Paralympic athlete, um, it sometimes comes with a little guilt, too, that um, it, it's great to see those ads through the Olympics and, and, the, and the Paralympics, but that's not nearly most of us, you know, and I find that um, it gives people a sense of maybe um, ease. Oh, look at them. I, you know, they're exceptional athletes. The life must be great. Um, great. <laughs> Wash my hands. <laughs> no, you know, no. Uh, so, and I and I was one of them. But that's for us to. Um, I don't know. They're just the presentation of disability in that kind of lionizing way. It concerns me uh, yeah. sometimes. That we're, yeah. We are so much more average and, and even less at, at times than and that. And that's who we are as, as a community. It's terrific that we have these very few that excel, but it would like it, I would love to see better representation of who we are. And maybe that would help. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, Jimmy, and we also have, I, I wanted to see if Whitney wanted to um, make a comment, because Whitney was our first uh, <laughs> registrant. Whitney, welcome. <laughs> Hello. I'm sorry. I've just kind of been lurking here. Um, no, you've been here. I've seen <laughs> you. Not lurking. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I should just introduce myself, I guess. Um, I am a parent, um, and my daughter is two and a half she has cerebral palsy and um we live in a really rural area um we live up in gray bruce and um ever since she was you know maybe six 12 months old um i've just kind of you know been trying to soak things up like a sponge and and learn as much as i can from as many different people and one of the things that i'm really keen to do in our community is hopefully um start up the beginnings of an adaptive sports league because at this point if we were to get involved with adaptive sports um, we'd have to go to the city and all of her appointments are in the city already and that's a two and a half hour drive usually and and we'd love to have something in our community because there are um, kids and people here who would um, just from kind of casual conversations would be really keen to be involved in these adaptive sports leagues and thankfully um uh, before i even had flora um 
I, uh, I met Jeff Virgo who, um, <laughs> works with you, Jeff, and, um, he and I have reconnected and, and he and I have been chatting. He's like, Winnie, this is so great. It's actually something that I've been thinking of for our area too. So, um, I'm so thankful for this presentation. I'm, I'm so thankful for all of you and, and I'm going to inevitably be banging down your emails at some point oh, too. <laughs> <laughs> with questions too, yeah. and, and yeah. excitement. And um, yeah, I'm just very thankful um, for all this information. Great. Thanks, Whitney. <laughs> yeah. Demi, would you like to say a few last words before we let Jeff off the hook for the evening? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. This has been very informative and engaging and I'm really enjoying it. Um, my only thoughts were just to add on to Jess's question earlier about like attitudes and preparedness and stuff with staff. And I think a lot of it is based on the fact that like we have people are well-meaning, as Maureen was saying, but that doesn't always go far enough. And I think there's a lot of entitlement and ma entitlement to mastery where they think like, well, I'm well-meaning, so I already know and I know this and that. And I think a lot of that stems just from all the good and bad information that is so easily accessible nowadays. <laughs> and so we see a lot of that where people come in and just think they know something because they saw it on Instagram <laughs> and like instead of actually finding out the real the truth and talking to human beings they'll look it up online which doesn't always help fill in that gap <laughs> so I think we get a lot of that but the one plus side nowadays is that we are in a culture now where people are a lot more comfortable to call each other out and I, well I should say more call each other in and acknowledge like Kind of that learning moment where they can say you know what you kind of said that wrong or there's a better way to approach that and i think that does go a long way with like preparedness and stuff which so i'm hoping that we're maybe on a little bit of a curve here where things might start to people mm -hmm. be more receptive to feedback and more open but it's hard to say where we're going with that yeah but yeah that's all for me thank you very much again thanks demi well jeff thanks so much for being here tonight and um again bringing us into the parasport world and your world um and i must say i'm really looking forward to all the connections that um we've been making so far with our new research center and um it is exciting to think about networks and doing things you know um in a coordinated uh, way with like allies so that when like one of us tries something all of us can support it and I think that's uh, it's really good and and I mean and as we start opening up more um, you know we want our students we want students who want to do this kind of work to have a place like our center to kind of say we're interested who can you connect us with and that's where we can do you know, some of our best work is say, well, here's Parasport and here's Flex for Access and here's, right, um, um, you know, whatever, we, whoever our networks are. So we really want, we, we want this to work in a way that's, that's super helpful. We're still very much out of the gate um, on our research center. And um, um, so this is, this is super exciting. And I also want to um, let, um, Demi and um, um, Elise know that um, um, uh, I invited Jeff to sit on our advisory committee for um, Kappa. Um, Jeff, and um, I'm hoping that Jess is also going to join that committee so that when we make decisions, um, we make them with. Um, I would love to. Yeah, we make them in consultation with our community. So we have. Um, yeah, we have a really good group from Niagara, um, but I don't want to limit it only to Niagara, and I want to make sure that we've got broad representation. So, yeah, that's that we've got. I'm waiting to hear back from one more person, and then we'll be able to have our first organizing mm -hmm. meeting of our advisory council. So that's going to be exciting, too. Anyway, Jeff, thanks so much for being here tonight, and thanks for letting us record you. And... Um, and yeah, here's to lots more um, exciting interactions in the future. Yeah, this has been terrific. Thank you very much for the invitation and, and really the privilege. I mean, um, learning from, from all of you is, has been um, just the thrill of the evening for, for me from, you know, your comments, uh, Demi and, and Elise and your questions and, and Whitney learning how we can help your 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 daughter um it, it just that's that's what we like to do and and jess of course uh, always 
lots to learn from from your perspectives and, and experiences. So to all of you, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, everyone.